Well, I don't know who chose the title of this event, which was Celebration of Giving, but they put together two words that I find interesting, celebration and giving. Giving, of course, has to have on the other side receiving. So essentially, when you give, you enter into a partnership with the receiver. And when you receive, you enter into partnership with the giver. So you give somebody in marriage because they are entering into a relationship where they give something to one another. You enter into a business partnership and you enter into a partnership where each member gives to the community. So it is with any community. It's a partnership and those who receive should remember that they're partners with the person who supports them. I always like the uh, metaphor of St. Paul talking about the community of the Christian church when he talks about the body and said we're many members and if we were all eyes, where would the hearing be? And so on. And when we go into a partnership, everybody has a different talent. So those who give and those who receive and those who administer, they're all important. And we should remember that and we should celebrate the participation of every member who is involved in the giving and the receiving. That is my sense of celebrating giving. Say a word about the uh, scientific uh, community. It's a an international, it's a universal community. And I think those of us who belong to it are very proud and find meaningful meaning in its objectives. And its objective primarily is to try to in increase the learning of mankind in order that it might serve the people of mankind. Of course, we need to remember that our scientific knowledge and our, what we contribute in science is morally neutral. And therefore, we need to know that there's not only intellectual learning, but there's also spiritual learning in order that we may know how to use what the science the community of science gives to society. And uh, we are judged, after all, by how we use the learning that we're privileged to receive. I'll make another observation, and that is all learning is personal, but it's not private. So it can be communicated. And we can communicate it when we're talking about intellectual knowledge in words and in mathematics and so on, the language of much of science. But we have to remember that there are other ways to communicate that are through art and through music, through dance, and so on. So the arts are very important, which I'm sorry, but you're all standing, but I led to another story, <laughs> which was one that I like. And that was uh, Niels Bohr, who was a famous physicist, and he was on his way at the end of his life, a little younger than I am now, to uh, receive a prize at the White House. And of course, Harvard and MIT grabbed him to give a lecture. At the end of the lecture, Niels Bohr was Danish. And he spoke 
English with marbles in his mouth, and his science was a bit over the heads of most of the people. And so, as a result, the physics professor who had introduced him got up rather timidly on the stage and said, are there any questions for Professor Bohr at the end of the lecture? Undergraduate hand went up. Yes, young man. Tell me, can you tell me, Professor Bohr, what good it did for you to study humanities as far as your scientific career is concerned? Of course, you're not the, the MIT had an, it decided that they should make every student take one course in humanities because they might become leaders of society and they should know something about the other dimensions of life besides mathematics. And so, Neil Bohr turned without a moment's notice and said, what do you know about my principle of complementarity? Now, for those of you who aren't physicists, the physics of complementarity comes from the fact that matter is not only described as particles, but also as waves. And because of the wave property of matter, you cannot determine precisely at the same time both the position and the momentum of the particle. So the, the boy said, of course, he knew about the principle of complementarity. Well, he said, you know, I got that idea. No, of course the boy didn't know. He said, while I was contemplating the relationship between mercy and justice, and the boy sat down. <laughs> well, let me say, what is the role of the uh, uh, scientific societies? Scientific societies have a purpose, which is essentially to promote partnering through dialogue. And um, they do so in conferences like this, where one scientist meets another scientist, and they talk, and they exchange ideas, and they meet one another. The young people come, and they're able to find people who employ when they're looking for jobs, and so on. Very important aspect. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so popular. As you see, we had a rather large group here from every, all parts of the world. And I like that because I think that the scientific activity that's so international is the greatest force for peace that we have, because you develop understanding of one another. And, and so the scientific communities and the scientific, they, they play a very important role, not only in science, but in the broader context of promoting peace in the world. Well, what else did I want to say? Uh, because I see it's, you're getting nervous standing so long. So <laughs> let, let, me, let me switch over and say, what about the Electrochemical Society? Let me say all the societies are facing the problem of change. Of course, as you know, change is everywhere in the world, and what we have to do is to learn how to adapt and to anticipate change. One of the difficulties that the society faces at the moment is the fact that certain people have learned they can make a lot of money by creating a new journal. And when they create a new journal, they, uh, all they have to do is to have the authors do the work of writing the paper, sending it to other authors who review the paper, sending it back to the author to respond, format it for them, do everything with the computer, and all they have to do is to put it on paper and send it to all the libraries of the world, and they make money. 
as a result, it's become a business. And so now they're creating one new journal after another. And the traditional role of the societies is being broken down because these, in their competition, artificially putting in these, these factors of how, how important their journal is. And the, my Chinese postdocs say, I can't get a job in China if I don't publish in one of these high impact journals. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's all fraudulent because you send something there. They don't know enough to know whether it's good or bad. When then they send it out to referees who don't know the field. You send it to the journal that is run by the society, then they know who the people are who are intelligent enough to give you a fair review of the paper. So I'm very interested and hope you have success in your idea of this free uh, access to try to compete with this uh, nonsense that's come in and it's corrupting the, the publication process in, in, in science as a whole at the present time. I should go back, too, to say about uh, <clears throat> 1950, when I was a graduate student, the electrochemical, as far as I was concerned, electrochemical society was somewhere off here. <laughs> and even solid state, which was just beginning to merge into things, the metallurgists and were coupled in to a certain extent to the physics community, but the solid state people were simply asked to grow the crystals and supply the materials that the physicists wanted to measure, or they were people who did crystallography and were stamp collecting as to how many different kinds of materials we could make. <laughs> and it began to change in about 1955, when the digital computer came along and the transistors came along and everything began to change. And so I personally have a view from of electrochemical society coming in rather late into electrochemistry on the battery field or the solid oxide fuel cell field. You saw first in the solid state community coming together of physics and chemi solid state chemistry and engineering. And it was a very important transformation, which is still going on, but was really run a very strong course in the last 50 years. The Electrochemical Society at the present moment, partly because people are making money with the lithium ion battery, <laughs> is seeing a joining of solid state chemistry and electrochemistry and engineering. And at the present moment, society faces a big crisis. We have to learn how to wean ourselves from our dependence on fossil fuels because we cannot sustain our present use of fossil fuels for very much longer before we're going to have a great crisis. So an important part of that is, is, is electrochemistry. And uh, the batteries are just one piece of that that is a very important piece in order for us to be able to transition from our dependence upon fossil fuels to our, go back to our dependence upon the energy from the sun. And so this is propelling the Electrochemical Society into a new era in which they're really playing a very important and fundamental role in society. So anybody who wants to partner with the Electrochemical Society will be partnering in an enterprise which I believe will give you great meaning in your life. And you, is something that when we make progress, we can all celebrate together that we're beginning to solve one of the critical problems of our society. 
Well, I've talked long enough. Thank you very much.